data generation, the 540i name makes a return along with the new 5 series. And this time is powered by a 3 liter inline 6 engine. The most powerful 3 liter petrol engine you can buy right now on a 5 series. Not too long ago, this car would have had a V8 under the bonnet, but hey, times are changing and so is BMW's naming structure. The first ever 540i came out in 1992 using the fabulous E34 5 Series chassis. It featured a naturally aspirated 4 liter V8 engine, which produced 282 horsepower and 400 newton meters of torque that could power the car from north to 100 km per hour in 6.3 seconds. This was replaced later on with the E39 540i in 1996. It had a 4.4 liter V8, naturally aspirated of course, that produced the same number of horsepower as the predecessor, but the torque figure was up to 420 and later on to 440. This E39 540i took 6.4 seconds to reach 100 km per hour from standstill. And finally, in 2005, the E60 540i was launched. It had a 4 liter V8 capable of producing 302 horsepower and 390 newton meters of torque. North 100 time was 6.2 seconds. So basically from 1992 until 2010 we've had a constant evolution but with pretty much the same performance figures. Until now. So we have 340 horsepower at our disposal, 450 newton meters of torque and a north to 100 km per hour time of just 4.8 seconds. And as a fun fact this car can reach 100 km per hour from standstill in the same time it took an E39 M5 to do the same thing. So that's progress for you. Granted, this car has all-wheel drive and an excellent automatic gearbox, but hey, times are changing. It can rev up to 7000 RPM and I don't think there's a place in the rev range where this engine doesn't pull like crazy. In reality, because of the car's size, you don't actually feel at what speeds you're traveling at, but if you just glance down at the speedo, you'll most definitely tell you're kind of breaking the law. <laughs> As with any big BMW with a proper engine, the moment you plant your foot on the throttle, the car just wafts along. And as soon as you touch the brake, the bonnet slams onto the front wheels and the back rises just a tad. These two things are kind of the only things that add some drama to the speed of this car. It's a bit weird as to why the car behaves like this, since it has such sophisticated damper management, but hey, maybe it's a feature. This car also features the M Sport pack with sportier looking front and rear bumpers, side skirts, lowered sport suspension and bigger and better brakes. It has basically the same exterior spec as the Touring we tested last week. Blue stone metallic color, 19 inch double spoke 664M wheels and full LED headlights. On the inside, however, things are quite a bit different. We now have the sport seats that are standard on the M Sport pack they are electrically operated and have memory functions. And, get this, are covered in blue leather. Night blue Dakota leather, to be exact. Now that's quite a brave choice, wouldn't you say? We also have the fully digital instrument cluster, a nice big head-up display, heated M Sport steering wheel and the dashboard is covered up in vinyl. Or as BMW likes to call it, Sensatec leather. But overall, I'd say it looks really good. I'm always surprised how these big BMWs grip to the road. It's mind-boggling. They have the speed, the acceleration, but they also have the handling of a proper BMW. I mean, I shouldn't really be surprised since the back tires are 275 in width and we have the excellent all-wheel drive system, but still it never ceases to amaze me. The suspension is a bit harsher than the Touring one, since it doesn't have air suspension at the back, 
but you can only tell the difference between the two suspensions on very, very bumpy roads and large potholes. It does, however, have less body roll than the Tory version, but I'm not sure if this is down to the suspension or to the reduced weight of the sedan. But anyway, each suspension has their own pros and cons. I'm getting a bit tired to say the whole thing about the steering being electrically operated and thus having no feedback from the road, but it's the same thing for the 540i. But in my opinion, BMW has the best judged electrically operated steering racks in the business. Until the technology improves, BMW's focus has moved on to making the steering more responsive, more precise and more natural feeling in everyday driving. It's just a matter of time until technology reaches a point where it will be possible to have an electric rack with the same feel as the old hydraulic one. But until then, if I had to choose a regular car based on its steering feel, I would definitely go for a BMW. So after driving the 530D and 540i back to back, would I choose this instead of the diesel? Now that's a very tough decision because right now I'm leaning towards the diesel. I don't know exactly why, it might be because the torque on the diesel is so addictive or maybe it's down to the fact that the diesel just fits better with the 5 series package. If I were in the position right now to buy a new 5 series, I'd have a lot of trouble choosing the right engine. Don't get me wrong, this petrol engine is absolutely stunning. It's powerful, refined and very quiet. And I think that might be its biggest problem. On the inside, there's very little noise coming from the exhaust, even if you're close to the red line. And without the help of the exhaust, the engine doesn't sound powerful enough, and at no time does it feel like it has over 300 horsepower. The 540i name creates a lot of expectations that the engine simply cannot sustain. As soon as you step on the throttle, you realize that the engine's 340 horsepower and 450 newton meters of torque are a piece of cake for this 5 series chassis. It feels like it can handle much more than that, and no matter how brutal you are with the car, it's close to impossible to reach its limits. So if you're like me, someone who likes a bit of drama added to the speed, then the torque of the 530D might just do the trick, and it's the engine I recommend you go for if you're looking to buy a new 5 Series.